In this video, we're going to talk about rank, which is a way of associating a particular number to a matrix. Honey, are you recording? Yeah, why? I mean, you... I really think you shouldn't record looking like that. <laughs> what are you talking about? Your head looks like a porcupine. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> this is beautiful. All right, <laughs> where were we? So, we are talking about the idea of rank. And I want you to imagine that you have some linear transformation. And I want you to think about it dynamically. A linear transformation, it picks up vectors in the domain and it spits out vectors in the codomain. Now I claim there's two possibilities. Suppose you have some vector that's living in the domain. The matrix A takes that vector to one of two things. It either takes it to zero, or it takes it to something non-zero. So let's suppose we're in the AX goes to zero case, where the matrix A kills off our zero. Then this vector X is in the null space of the matrix A. In other words, this is just the definition of saying that X is an element of the null space of A. And I want to point out that the null space here, this is some subset of Rn. And Rn here is the domain of our transformation. I'm imagining that I have my standard m by n matrix. It takes an n vector in the domain to an m vector in the codomain. Well, I can also see what happens in the codomain. I could also say that Ax so this is some vector, it might be zero, but it might be non-zero as well, and generically it's gonna be non-zero. This vector, the, the image of the vector x, is something that lives in the column space of A. So Ax itself is going to live in the column space of A, and this is going to be a subset of Rm, or in other words, a subset of the codomain. So these two different ideas, the null space, which is one subspace of the domain, and the column space, which is a subset of the codomain, are in some sense connected. And what we want to explore in this video is that connection, but a little bit deeper. So I want to give a specific example of a matrix, just so we have something concrete to talk about. So I'm going to talk about this particular matrix here. Now. This matrix I've already put in the reduced row echelon form, but if it wasn't in the reduced row echelon form, we could put it into RREF. We wouldn't change any solutions to it. And I want to notice two things. First of all, we've previously talked about how to find the null space, and that the null space is in a sense generated by the columns that do not have a leading one in them. And we would do our normal methodology where you would put a parameter into each of the variables, the second, the fourth, and the fifth in this particular case, and that you would do your back substitution and you would get out of it three vectors, one for each of these associated free columns. And so those were the process by which we figured out the null space. And so one of the things that we could say was that the dimension, indeed have said in a previous video, the dimension of that null space in this particular case is equal to three, the number of leading ones. And generically, this is going to be the number of free columns. All right, that's all very lovely, but let's go a little bit further. Now I wanna talk about the column space. And you might recall from the previous video as well that the column space we had said was generated by the columns that do have leading ones in them. So in other words, we can say that the dimension of the column space of A was in this particular case two, but generally it's the number of columns with leading ones. Number of columns with leading ones. All right, so we've done a bit of review, but now I want to focus on what is going to be the interesting principle that, that connects these two different ideas. Notice that if I add together the number of columns with leading ones and the number of free columns, 
I've got all of the columns. In other words, in this particular scenario, what we're going to have is that the number of leading one columns and the number of free columns are going to be five, and generically n if it's an m by n matrix. This lovely property, by the way, is not a coincidence of the particular matrix. Indeed, the Gaussian algorithm means that this is always going to be true. So what we have is this kind of cute little formula, and I can restate it in the following way. I can say that n, the number of columns I have in my matrix, is going to be the dimension of the column space of the matrix A plus the dimension of the null space of the matrix A. Indeed, this follows because we had identified the column space with the columns that had leading ones, and we'd identified at least the number of basis vectors in the null space was associated to the number of free columns, and so they added up in this really nice way. Now, this property is going to be important enough that we're actually going to give it a new name. I am going to define something referred to as the rank of a matrix A. And typically this is just given the symbol R, and it's just one of these two terms, it's this one right there. It is going to be the dimension of the column space of A. Or another way to think about it, the rank is the number of leading ones. And then we can look at our little statement that we have here about how N breaks up as a sum of two things, to get some nice formula for the dimension of the null space of a matrix A, this is just going to be precisely n minus r. And then if you think about it, the n minus r, which is the dimension of the null space, plus the r adds up to the value of n. Now, I want to note one thing. This r here is unique. You might have recalled that back in the day we had a theorem that said the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is unique. There is only one. You and I might have different row echelon forms because we might choose different orders of our row operations and it, it might look a little bit different. However, the reduced row echelon form, you and I have to agree as long as we haven't made any algebra mistakes. It is unique. And if the RREF is unique, the number of leading ones that you have is also going to be unique and therefore the rank is going to be unique. So, in essence, what we've done is we've taken some matrix and we've associated to the matrix one integer called the rank. And that this integer plays this really nice interplay between the dimensions of the column space and the dimensions of the null space. Now, finally, I want to note that the type of mathematics that I do is something called algebraic topology. And algebraic topology is all about ideas related to this, where you have something really complicated, and I'm going to say generally matrices are complicated. They've got all sorts of components, they've got little details, the numbers inside of them actually matter. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to pull out of it what we're going to call an invariant. A very simple algebraic thing, like in this case it's one number, it's an integer, it's a positive integer r. And associated to this matrix, this complicated thing that has all sorts of information for all the different components, there's one simple number associated to it, this rank. Now, the rank doesn't tell you everything, of course. It's better to have the full matrix than it is to have the rank. But if you know the rank, you can still get a lot of relevant information. And this idea is a really big theme in mathematics, and it's a really big thing in algebraic topology, where you have some really weird and bizarre shape that's challenging to understand. And what you try to do is associate to this really weird thing a very simple, easy to understand algebraic number that doesn't tell you all the information, but tells you enough information for you to get a handle on it. And so this idea is very simple, but elegant, but has an enormous amount of power within mathematics.